All righty. Hi, everybody. So thank you for joining. Um, today we'll be talking about work procedures. And these are the most common procedures that I've found that you have to do as a junior doctor. A lot of them are, are kind of surgical-ish because obviously the surgery does more procedures than, than medicine. But I still think it's relevant, um, especially the first few. I think they're incredibly relevant because it doesn't matter what department you're working in, you'd still have to do it. I'm currently working at a GP practice and I still do that one. Um, but the rest, I think, are just important to know because at some point you will be asked to do one um, and you have trained. You, you can do it. Um, you've done it on, on mannequins before, I'm sure. But I think it just helps to, you know, just hear that, go through the steps again and just hear that, listen, you, you can do it. Um, because I think that's what I needed the first time that I had to do some of these in the hospital. Um, so let's begin. So today we'll be talking about venipuncture, which is a super common procedure that's done everywhere, including GP practices, where there's a lot of things that we don't do. Um, but taking bloods is one thing that we still do. IV cannulation, uh, ABGs, putting in a catheter, putting in an NG tube. Uh, and then hopefully at the end we'll have a, a short question and answer session. So for each procedure, what I'll do is I'll run through what stuff you need, because obviously um, uh, sometimes you get very lucky and the nurses will be nice enough to arrange everything for you. But a lot of the times, especially when things are busy, you have to go and get everything yourself. So I think just having that practical aspect to it, which I, medical school doesn't really focus too much on, I think is a little bit helpful. And then for venipuncture, I'll go through all the steps step by step because, again, it's a very common procedure. And if we break things down, I think people get more confident to do it. Uh, and then we'll just watch a video and then I'll give you tips on the procedure that we're talking about. So let's begin. So for venipuncture, and there's a lot of ways to do this and there's a lot of variation here. Um, I also forgot to put gloves on the slide, probably because it was a very busy slide as is, but that goes without saying for all of these procedures, you need PPE. Um, so that means gloves, apron, sometimes you have to wear extra masks or, you know, shield because of COVID. But but that goes without saying, but I'm still saying it. I don't want to hear that any of you guys are doing these procedures without, without gloves. So uh, I personally prefer to use a butterfly needle. Um, for the simple reason that it's um, it's very easy to see, like there's a visual cue when you're in the vein that you're trying to take blood from. Um, there is another variation of this where it's just a needle. It's it's literally all this tubing in the middle basically is missing. It's just needle on this end and then this black needle on the other end, and that's it. And, I, and I've seen some incredible nurses, the GP practice where I work at now, they're just crazy. They just put it in and that's it. And they know that they're inside the vessel. I could never do that. Um, but I use a butterfly needle with it with this needle holder barrel. There are some kits where this is already preformed. It's already put together and you just open the pack and you can use it. Uh, skin wipes, obviously, you need to try to make everything as aseptic as possible. Um, a disposable tourniquet you might find in some places they have like the reusable one in our GP practice we just use the reusable one where you just clip it and then just pull but the, in the hospital most of the time we use disposable tourniquets gauze dressing so you know for after once you're done with the procedure you can just put one down and then we usually have surgical tape so we just put surgical tape on and that's it and then the last thing and I think actually the most important thing is the, the correct blood tube there's no point taking blood from a patient or just pricking them if you don't have the correct tubes. And I, I know it seems strange, but sometimes you do run out of the correct tube that you're looking for. Um, I think in it was like the biggest thing for me, and I've messed this up a couple of times because I took blood from a patient and I forgot to send a sample with the right with the right tube. So, you know, when you're like, oh, we want blood, we want full blood count, coagulation profile, LFTs. RFT, CRP, and you're just ticking the boxes and you're pressing the button in the computer and that's it. But a lot of those tests need different vials. They need bloods in different vials. I'll run through that at the end as well, but just something to keep in mind. So for procedures, right, obviously we're going to run through it step by step. You're walked into the ward. You're going to take bloods from a patient. You're going to wash your hands, put on PPE. You're going to go introduce yourself and you're going to make sure that it's the right patient. Okay. And this is a big thing because it happens a lot, okay? You walk into a room and you're like, oh, Mr. Peter, whatever. And the patient, who is also another 80-year-old, will just say yes, even though it's not him, okay? Because, you know, they can be frail and confused and they just hear whatever and they'll just say yes, 
and then you go make sure you check their tag because you will be surprised how many times they'll say yes and it's not them. So always make sure you're going to the right patient. And then you just explain to them, hi, I'm here to take blood. Now, in a hospital, they get their blood taken so often they know how this goes. It's not really a problem. You don't need to get a huge consent process or anything like that. And they'll most of the time, they'll just roll up their sleeve and they'll just be like, here, just take my blood. But um, but it's, you know, this is these are just the steps of how to do it. Um, positioning is very important, and I'll, I'll I'll say this now that positioning is what will, is what will make or break any of your procedures. It, it doesn't matter how hard or easy it is. It, if your positioning is bad, you're you're basically setting yourself up to fail. So always try to make sure that the positioning is 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 good. Um, and then asking a patient if they're in pain for any procedure is is really important. Now I will mention that sometimes you don't really have a choice. And you have to do some of these procedures, but it is always good to ask um, about any pain. Now, I think this is the part where people get uh, very scared is just, you know, finding a vein. Now, obviously, in, you know, most of us are very young and healthy. They, it's very easy to find our veins. They kind of just, they're just sticking out asking to be pricked. But for patients who are a little bit older and they've had multiple cannulas put in and multiple venipunctures, their veins tend to disappear almost. You can't even find them no matter what you do. Um, the medial cubital vein is a pretty good vein, um, but again, it gets used so often that it's sometimes very, very difficult to find. Um, you should try to avoid places where the skin is, is broken. And I, I personally find that if you, if you trace, and I think this is most visible with the veins in your hand, if you trace the veins, you'll see that they kind of connect and they're always like tributary. So it's like multiple veins coming together to want to form one bigger vein. That one straight bigger vein is usually a lot better. Um, if you go for the straight segment of that of that bigger vein, try to avoid going into one of the smaller veins and then crossing over that connection point. There's usually a valve there. Uh, positioning their hand is very important, like I mentioned. So just try to make it as straight as possible. Um, and that way it makes it easier for you to kind of pull on their skin as well so you can hold that vein in place. Wherever you think you're going for, so it can even be on the hand, and I've taken blood from patients' hands as well because sometimes that's the only veins they have left. So I always just take like four fingers, I just grab their hand like this, and I just put my tourniquet wherever wherever four fingers away from uh, I'm planning on taking blood. Um, I always just palpate and try to make sure that I can feel the vein. It's the whole thing with procedures is that you have to feel confident. And I think you feel more confident when you're like, oh, yeah, I can feel that. I can I know what I'm trying to do here, as opposed to when you're just like, I think there's a vein there. I'll stick it in. I, maybe I'll get it. Maybe I don't. I, I, I think it's better to just take the time and just make sure that you're actually, you know, you're you're feeling the vein. Um, and then once you're happy with that, you should probably remove your tourniquet. Now, in real life, a lot of people don't do that but you should remove the tourniquet and then just wipe the skin clean uh, and then probably put your gloves on. I The order of this I've taken from, from Geeky Medics and obviously it's an, an ideal setting, but you should always try to fulfill the tenets of what you're trying to do more, more important than doing all the proper steps all the time. So for example, you'll see this all the time we when we go to see people's veins like I will even before I get all my kit I will come with just a tourniquet I'll put it on a patient's hand or arm and I'll just feel their veins with my finger no gloves I've washed my hands and I'm just feeling it with my fingers they'll tell you oh you need gloves all the time you need to do that but you don't need to I I just want to feel the vein that's my mission so as long as I can feel the vein I'm happy with that and then it you know I'll put gloves on for when I'm putting you know taking my sample but I'm not going to have gloves on for every every Part of the procedure it's just a waste of gloves but anyway we'll, we'll see how that goes so just make sure that you wipe the area quite well and maybe a little bit more than you know what you think you don't have to just do one pinprick area it should be like the whole the whole area that you're going for and then just let it dry ideally 30 seconds yes but i'll be honest if you watch most people if it lasts more than 10 seconds i'll be very impressed so then you have to insert the needle which is maybe the scariest part for most people. So again, you put the tourniquet back on and you have your system ready. So you have the, the needle and the collection system ready and you unsheath the needle. Now, this is a part where I feel a lot of people make a mistake. And I've seen this with some of the students who've come through as well. They So you have to pinch the, the butterfly wings, right? To hold the needle and to, and to put it into the patient. You have to make sure that the bevel is up. 
Okay, I've and and again, it's it's difficult because you know people get nervous and they just oh you know it's just another step, but really make sure the bevel is up because if you do it of the other way, it's very likely that you you'll you'll get flashback, but it won't you won't get any blood. So always make sure that the bevel is up. The easiest way to remember this is the rough side of the wings go together. Like you you pin, you're holding the rough side, not the not the soft side, not the smooth side of the wings, but the rough side when you when you do it you'll remember me hopefully so then you know you you the 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 biggest thing i have to say is you have to hold the vein you have to anchor the skin in the vein be below where you're going because if you don't you'll go in and the vein will move and you, and you'll just be traveling in like the subcutaneous tissue so you have to make sure that you hold on what you're what you're trying to do and then you tell them that, oh, it's going to be a sharp scratch. But at this point, the patients have been pricked like 30 times. So they're like, yeah, OK, sure. Sometimes they'll even crack a joke and be like, oh, it doesn't feel like a sharp scratch. You have to be like, I know, I'm sorry, but I have to do this. So um, the, the angle of insertion, I think, is very important. A lot of people either go too, too flat or they go too, like, you know, too, uh, too acutely. I'm, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but they, you have to go for 30 degrees. You have to try to be slipping it into where you're going. You can't be too flat because it, it'll just travel along the vein above it and you can't be too much because you'll just go through the vein. Um, and even if you go in, the angle is just not suitable for the blood to travel up the, 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 the needle. So 30 degrees, try your best. Again, you know, it comes with experience, but but you'll find that angle that works for you and then you'll just automatically do it like that. Once you are in and you see the flashback, make sure that you advance a little bit further. And the reason for that is that you might think that, oh, you know, I've gotten a little bit of flashback and, you know, I'm in. But then when you put in your 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 vacutane, your collection tube, it just like a little bit of blood will come and that's it. Uh, when that happens, it's not game over, by the way. I've I've done that a few times. If you just advance the needle a little bit, it'll the blood suddenly starts picking up and, and you're good to go. Um, me personally, I do this. I put my my thumb of the, the of my left hand onto the skin of the patient. So I'm literally holding the needle in place onto the skin of the patient using using the butterflies. Does anybody know what flashback is? Does anyone wanna share? with me real quick what flashback is uh, basically when you're inserting the the needle you're mm -hmm. watching the back of the like insertion point and mm -hmm. you're watching that and then you're going to see some blood come okay. out and uh, i was advised to advance a little bit more because uh what sometimes happens is that yes you're seeing that flashback but you're literally kind of um perpendicular to yeah. or like parallel to the border like the wall of the vein so that might impede blood flow out, so. Yeah, exactly. So that's why you wanna make sure that you're all the way in. Um, but yeah, that's what flashback is. It basically, it's just a little bit of blood that appears within the, within the plastic of the, of, the, of the butterfly needle. And it's, it's the same with other things as well when you're using basically like a syringe or anything to take blood from a patient. It's just that initial burst of, of blood. Um, but here's an image that I thought was very important. We're going to watch this video in a minute as well, but it's just, I think it's very important to people to realize that that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that blood to start coming down the, the, the needle um, and then going, going uh, into the plastic part of the tube of the, of the butterfly needle. So again, so now, you know, you, you're in, uh, you're, you know, you, you know that you're in the vein and there's blood coming as well. So now you have to attach the blood bottle. Now there is an order, uh, despite what you've probably seen, everybody just kind of grab a tube and just put it in and then put it out and then put another one in. Uh, there is an order to it. And the reason being is that they sometimes can cross contaminate each other. It isn't that big of an issue if you have like a decent amount of blood in each tube, um, but you know, in patients where you can barely get some, it, it the order makes a difference. And we'll run through that later on. Um, sometimes you'll feel that, oh, it's starting and then suddenly the blood just stops working. It might be because the, you know, the, again, the needle is, might have just moved a little bit. So just try adjusting the needle. Don't just give up, which is uh, usually the first instinct when you're like, oh, I've missed or like, oh, I've got flashback. But you know, it was working and now it stopped working. You, it's still within reach. You just have to adjust your needle a little bit. And then you release the tourniquet before you pull out the needle. 
Um, a lot of people forget to do that, and then that sometimes leads to burst veins, and you can tell because like there'll be like swelling and a hematoma. So try to you know just remove the tourniquet. It's hard to remember sometimes, but remove the tourniquet before you remove the needle. Um, usually, I just grab a piece of gauze and I just press it, and then I pull out the needle, and then I just you know, and then I sheath the needle, and then I usually ask the patient to put their finger on the on the on the gauze while I get rid of the. I just well. So ideally, you would have a sharps box with you whenever you go to take, you know, um, blood from a patient, but it's not really practical. So um, what we usually do is that you, as long as it's sheathed and it's covered and it's protected, I just put it back in my tray or my kidney dish, and then you can dispose of it later. Um, and then I usually take another piece of gauze and I kind of fold it into a four by four, like fold it into fourth, and then just put it a plaster onto the patient, and that's about it. You can invert the bottles, but it's it's actually really funny. People do very, like, they have their own ways of doing stuff. And because it works, no one changes it. I've seen people just go, like, like they just shake it and it works. I really would just, just turn it back and forth. But there is a number and you're meant to do it. And some people don't. Um, and it's not, and again, it's not an issue when you get a decent sample size because the blood kind of protects itself. A little bit but when you have a minimal amount of blood and you don't shake it it can really just ruin and hemolyze the sample so make sure that i there's a specific number for each bottle but i just do eight times for all of them because i know that you know it doesn't matter as long as i do eight it's fine and then you want to make sure that everything is you know in the right place and you clean up after yourself you don't leave things by the bedside which you'll see sometimes doctors will just do their thing and they'll walk away but you know it's your sharp it's your responsibility it's as simple as that if someone else gets a needle stick injury because of your sharp that's like that's a never incident that should never happen and then obviously you thank the patient you label the sample you label the form that goes with it you make sure that it's in the right place usually there's a usually there's like a tray in the ward somewhere where a porter will come and take it down to pathology. If it's a really urgent sample, you can go and find one of the vacuum tubes and you can put it in the in one of the canisters and just put it in the wall and it goes. Um, if my hospital has one, I'm 100% sure your hospital will have one too. Um, so yeah, just because you're done with the procedure doesn't mean that you're done with everything that you need to do. So we'll just watch a really quick video. Uh, this is from Geeky Medics which I find very helpful. It might be considered cheating, but I think they make really good videos. And whenever I get stuck in anything and it's procedure related, I will just Google and see if there's a, a Geeky Medics video on it because it's incredibly helpful. So we'll just watch this really quickly. Hi there, I'm Andrew, one of the family of medical students. Could I just confirm your name and date of birth, please? Hi, Amanda Gilbert, 6th February 1992. Nice to meet you, Amanda. And today I've been asked to take some blood from you. Would that be OK? Yeah, that's fine. This will just involve using a small needle and inserting it into one of the veins in your arms. It might be a touch uncomfortable, but won't be painful. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. OK. Are you allergic to anything at all? Mm. Fantastic. I'll just gather my equipment and then we'll begin. OK. Sharp scratch.
Thank you, Amanda. That completes the procedure. Are you feeling okay? Great. Uh, I'm now going to send your blood samples off to the lab, and the results will be back with us shortly. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, great video by them. Um, when it goes great, it really is as simple as that. It's like, oh, you just put the needle in, you advance a little bit, flashback, collect the blood sample, you're done. And then sometimes, unfortunately, it's, it's a lot harder, but, but that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just how the game goes sometimes. So, um, so specifically, I, I just wanted to run through this. I, th I hope you guys can zoom in. Um, I know that there is a functionality here. I, I don't think I can force you guys to zoom in. But basically, there is this this sheet is made by the people who make the the blood blood tubes here in the UK, and every trust has a version of this. Now, it might not be everywhere, which it should be. Um, I found this in like the medical education department by myself because I went there and, and just to get some extra training on blood collection. Um, and they showed me this, but I was like, why isn't this on the ward? I don't think anybody is actually aware of this, that there's actually an order on how to take the, the blood samples and how much to shake them and what tube does what test. And it's different in every trust. So here, for example, they do. Um, so for in, in my trust, lavender tubes are for for a cross match, but in their trust, I actually don't know what they use for cross match. I can't actually. Oh, yeah, they use the pink one. And the pink one we use for, for full blood count. So it's switched in our trust. So it's not uniform everywhere. And it doesn't have to be. It's, you know, depending on what they're using, what the manufacturer is giving them, it, different colors might mean different things. So there's no point memorizing this, is what my point is. But you just need to be aware that depending on where you're working, the colors do different things. And, you know, you should collect the samples that you need. So if you want a coagulation, you have to remember to do the light blue one. If you want just the biochemistry, the UNEs and stuff like that, you have to remember to do the gold one and stuff like that. So just, just keep in mind that that's something that exists in different hospitals. Um, so just my tips, because I think, again, no, you know, you feel very in your head about these type of things, but don't be afraid to miss. There's a reason why, you know, you know, you have so many people there. And you have phlebotomists as well, and even phlebotomists miss. And their literal job, all they do is they just take blood from people. That's it. And even they miss. So it's it's fine. But just, you know, give it your best shot. Always be sure to at least try. You know, at least then you can say, that, listen, I tried twice. I missed. I'm sorry. You don't even have to apologize. You can say, I just, you know, I, I, it, I missed. That's fine. Everyone does it. You can do it. If someone's being really upset about you, you can say, why don't you have to go? You know? So it's fine. There's nothing wrong. It doesn't mean you're any less of a doctor. Again, you're not a phlebotomist. You're a doctor. There's many things that you do. This is just one of your thing, one of your skill sets. Uh, measuring twice, cutting once. I think I've put this multiple times across the presentation, but it really is really important. Like you, I have like especially some some of the harder arterial samples that I had to take. I was there for at least five minutes, just like literally five minutes, just feeling this guy's pulse to find out if I could just be happy with one spot of where to take. He was very sick, so it was very hard to, to get, get his sample in. Multiple people had missed at that point, so I went there and I literally spent five minutes just, just feeling for a pulse. And until I was happy that this is the point that I want to go into, I didn't do anything. So take the time and until you feel confident that, okay, yes, there's a vein there, I'm going to go there. That's when you should you give it a go. Until you feel that confident, I think it just just wait. Just just spend the time and become more confident in, in what you're about to do. And then if you're in doubt, you know, ask somebody else. You know, you, there's like weird lesions on their arm. There's an injury. You know, ask your senior, ask your F2, ask your registrar, you know. Um, they might be able to do it for you if they, you know, if you, it's, it's a very difficult one. They can do it for you. So, so don't don't be afraid to ask for help. That's why everybody's there. That's why it's a team-based thing. So that's why um, just make sure to get other people involved. So we'll move on now to the next one, which is my least favorite procedure of all of these procedures, and that is IV cannulation, <laughs> for the simple reason that I, as an F2, only get asked to do the most difficult IV cannulations. 
So I obviously miss. And the only person who can do it is an anesthetist who comes with a with a with a ultrasound, and they spend like I don't know, like ten minutes just trying to get it. And if they are struggling with an ultrasound machine, how do you think I am supposed to get it blind? So I've reached that stage where I only get asked to do the really hard, impossible ones, and I usually miss, which is why I probably don't like them as much. But that being said, it's a very key skill in the hospital, especially because it doesn't matter what department you're in, you're still be asked to put a cannula in. Um, the steps are very similar. It's just the setting, the setup is a little bit more different. You need a little bit more supply. So instead of a needle, because you're not just collecting blood, you're, need, you're putting in a plastic tube, which is the cannula. So that's what you need uh, to start off with. You need um, an extension set or usually an adapter. So basically the end of this, once you have your cannula in, there's usually uh, just like a, like a spout. And you either want to put an adapter in so that it's, you know, it stops the blood just flowing out all the time or an extension set, which is basically the same thing. Um, and you can, uh, you, and then you need a flush. So you need saline and then a syringe to you drop the, 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 you know, the normal saline to flush it. Um, nowadays, there's usually, there's already something called posi flush, I think is what it's called. They, they're, they're tubes that all, they're basically 10 cc syringes that have, you know, flush in them already. So you just open it and you just inject, you don't have to draw out fluid and stuff. Um, and then as always, you need skin prep, you need a gauze. The different thing is that you need a cannula dressing, which is, uh, which is just a specific like sticker that you kind of just put on top of the cannula just to keep it in place. Um, we'll just watch the video because I think it's just, it's, it's just easier if you explain, if you just watch it rather than me going through all the steps. Hi there, I'm Andrew, one of the final year medical students. Could I confirm your name and date of birth, please? Sure, it's James, 13th of December 1989. Nice to meet you, James. Today I've been asked to insert a cannula into your arm. It's a small plastic tube that will allow us to give fluids and medication. It might be a bit uncomfortable, but it won't be painful. Is that okay? Yes, it is, yeah. Brilliant. Are you allergic to anything at all? No, not that I know of. Fantastic. I'll just gather my equipment and then we'll begin. If you could just lift your arms up for me, James. Okay, James, sharp scratch. James, I'm just going to flush the cannula now. Do let me know if there's any pain.
Thank you, James. We're all done. Are you feeling okay? Yes, I am. Thank okay. you. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, perfect. Now, obviously, that's the in the most ideal situation where it's that easy and straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, it's not usually that easy. But again, you know, there's as long as you have your setup, you tried your best, your positioning was fine. You know, you gave it a go. It's it's completely fine to be like, you know, OK, I, I can't do it. Can we get someone else? Can we get a mini statistic to come and do it? The biggest thing and the biggest mistake that people do is that once they get flashback coming in their um, in their cannula, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm in. OK, all right, that's good. I'm going to slide my needle out and push my cannula. Please don't do that, because what will happen is that you think that your your what's it called? Your cannula is all the way in the vein. It's literally right at the tip. And there's enough just for blood to come through. But if you try to push your pla the plastic in, what will happen is that it'll it'll just it'll kind of just like kink, and it'll go out, and there just won't be any um, what's it called? It just won't go into the vein, and then you won't get any blood coming out. Um, so if once you get flashback, it just advance it a little bit further. And a good sign that oh that it's going well is that you'll see that the the flashback the blood starts coming even faster and that's like a pretty good sign that okay now I'm 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 pretty confident I'm in I'm in the vein. Straight segments obviously you you don't want to go into a segment sometimes you don't have a choice but you don't want to go into a segment which is too like twisty or convoluted. If it's a straighter you know if it's a straighter vein it's easier to go into and just kind of put it in, uh, put your vein in. There's so many different ways to do it uh, of putting a cannula in. Um, I think the biggest thing is always that you can go in a little bit more, you know, steep. And then when you get a flashback, just flatten it and then just advance a little bit further. Um, and that seems to work, you know, for the few times that I actually managed to get one in. Um, but yeah, and anesthetists are definitely your friends. So if, you know, you feel like, OK, I just I can't. I've done everything I can. It, there is a mechanism in your hospital to get an anesthetist, whether you have to call the on call one or sometimes they have a list somewhere that, you know, they have their emergency list. So you can just pop in all the details and just put the details on there and they'll just come and do it whenever they get a chance. But they're definitely your friends and they will come and help you out if you need to. Uh, we'll just run on to the next procedure. So that's just an ABG. So this is for patients who are having respiratory problems. You want to see how their pH is doing. You want to make sure that there's no acidosis, alkalosis. You want to see if there's no any electrolyte ab abnormality, and you want it done very quickly. You can obviously do a normal blood sample, but it takes time. It has to be sent to the lab. It needs to be processed. All that stuff. An ABG. You literally you take the sample, and you can walk over to wherever the machine is. You just put the sample into the machine, and it tells you the result immediately which is why it's so handy. You really don't need that much stuff to do an ABG. You literally just need skin prep, the ABG needle with the adapter, which of the adapters just to put it into the machine, just some gauze dressing. And lidocaine is optional. Honestly, I have not seen anybody use it for the simple reason that the needle that nowadays that we use to take the sample is the same size as the needle that's for the injection. And, you know, like if you, if you inject them, the, that will be painful and then you know you'll inject them again so rather just go in once get it and just get out and more most patients understand that and they're they're happy with that um but it is something that yes technically you could do it with pediatrics i've heard that with pediatrics yeah absolutely if i'm doing it on a child for whatever reason i will 100 percent do lidocaine first but otherwise i'm just gonna go in and, and go out and when you do more you become more confident in doing them so that way you 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 realize that it's like oh I actually yeah I think it's better if I just do it quickly and just get the sample and get out rather than injecting and putting them through all of that. So we'll just watch another quick video on how to do an EBG as well. Hi there, my name's Andrew. I'm one of the final year medical students. Could I just check your name and date of birth, please? Sure, it's James Alexander, 13th of December, 1989. Nice to meet you, James. Today I've been asked to do a procedure called an arterial blood gas. Um, this involves taking some blood from the artery in the wrist. I'm going to use some local anaesthetic, so it shouldn't be painful, but it might be a bit uncomfortable. Is that OK? That sounds fine. Can I just check before we begin? 
Have you ever been told you have problems with your circulation? No. Okay. Do you take any blood thinners, such as warfarin? No, I don't think. Okay. And have you ever been told that you have problems with clotting? No. Brilliant. Can I also check, James, do you have any allergies at all? No, I don't. Brilliant. I'll just gather my equipment. James, I'm just going to do a quick test to assess the blood supply to your hand. Could you just make a very tight fist for me? And hold it there. I'm now going to press on each side of the wrist. Keep your fist as it is. And relax. James, that's the end of the procedure. Thank you very much. So yeah, um, I, I will say that ABGs are a lot easier than than cannulation or venipuncture, and it, it really, you know, as long as, as once you as you're sure that there's a, you know, there's an artery there and you go down uh, the right way, it does work. My only hints for, for that is that you, you do spend the time and you make sure that, you know, oh, yeah, I'm very confident that the artery is running through there. And I always make make sure that I hold. So with my left hand, I'm I'm still feeling the pulse, and then I'm going from a distal angle and I'm going towards it. And that way, I can kind of like manipulate my needle towards where I can feel the pulse. And it really is because it's arterial. Once you're in, you'll just start see the blood just coming into the tube. Sorry, into the tube. Um, and and it's 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 quite nice because like again, it just comes up and then you, and you're done you may need to make adjustments so you might go in and you might not see anything that doesn't mean that oh that's it it's completely failed it's the same with the other procedures you might put your needle in and nothing comes out that doesn't mean it's the end of the procedure have a little bit of confidence and just think about okay you know i maybe i'm onto the i'm a little bit left or a little bit right of the artery let me just adjust my needle a little bit and you just it's literally just a little manipulation and suddenly you get a flashback and that's it um, I found and I, I did this once on a pancreatitis patient and they'd been getting ABGs all day and night because obviously you have to keep an eye and you want to make sure that the respiratory status isn't going. And and I went in and I just I, I got very lucky in fairness, but I just put in my sample. I put in my needle. It, it came out immediately. I took it out. And then I always before I even entered the room, I take a, a two by two, which is just a piece of gauze and I just fold it and I put tape over it, so it's ready. So I literally have to just put it onto the skin of the patient and it just sticks on. So I had that ready with me. So within a minute, I, I went in, took the blood, took it off, closed the needle, put it back on the tray, put the thing on, and you, the, the the relative of the patient was like, wow, that was pretty, uh, that was quite good. Uh, you know, uh, everyone else has been struggling. And I was like, yeah, I just got very lucky. 
but but just having everything prepared beforehand is always what makes the difference. Now, on a practical note, you need to get 0.7 ml is what they recommend of of, uh, of a blood sample. And then on top of that, you want to make sure that you know the patient's details, their temperature, and how much oxygen they're receiving. Because when you go onto the machine uh, to, to give them a sample to interpret the results, you need to give them all these details because you have to manually write in all these things. You'll get training before you get to use the machine and you're cleared to use the machine, but I'm just letting you know that this is something to consider. So we'll move on to the next procedure, which is urinary catheterization. So this is something that I feel that you'll only have to do really if you're in surgery. Um, and most other departments don't get asked to do this and they'll just be called, they'll just call whoever surgery on call is and they're one of their juniors will come and, and do it. But at some point that will be you. So I think it's best that we, we run through the steps and we may, and, you know, see, you, let you know what's in your, in your arsenal and what you need to get before you give it a go. So a catheter pack is available in most wards now. Um, basically, all it is, it has all the sterile gloves you need. It has a bit of gauze. It has a garbage bag. It has uh, a pot, usually, with little swabs and like a clip thing. And then it has a, a sterile field that you can use. So this is one thing that you, I really recommend you get. Because you can get all of these things individually as well, but it just helps to just grab the pack. Um, you need normal saline to wash and clean. So usually I just grab one of these pods um, and then you, what you can do is you can just crack it open and just press it into the tray here. And that kind of creates your reservoir um, that you can use to then clean everything before you insert your, your catheter. Instilla gel. So this is basically just, it's a syringe with gel in it. And the gel is a mixture of a lubricant and lidocaine, which is an anesthetic. Um, and this is very useful in multiple contexts, but here it's you, you put this in first to, to obviously to help make things easier to put in, but also just to numb everything because it is a little bit discomfortable and can be painful. You need a catheter bag, obviously, because once you've hooked up your catheter and everything's set up, you want to be able to measure you know, the urinary output and, and you also need somewhere for the urine to go, so you need a catheter bag. Um, there are many different types of Foley catheters depending on if they're male, female, uh, whether you, they need irrigation or not. So there's a two-way or a three-way, depending on, on the indication. Most of the time, you'll just be putting a regular two-way catheter in. Usually, it's the urologists who do the three-ways. That being said, I've been forced to do that because we don't have urology cover at night. So if you're in working nights and somebody needs a irrigation because they've had, like, they're bleeding a lot or something like that, they need to put a three-way in. It's called a three-way because it has three, basically, um, openings at the end so one is an output for the for just you know the urine from the bladder one is the the balloon input so that you can put the fluid into the balloon to inflate it and one is an irrigation so you can actually hook up normal saline on like an infusion and just let it run so what it does is it, it puts water into the bladder kind of washes everything out and then it comes out um, so this is what irrigation is basically what you'll also need is 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 water different to this one to fill up the balloon so usually there is actually um, syringes that specifically say um, normal saline for inf inflation or what it, there's a word for it I, I've forgotten but it basically it's just it's it's the 10 ml you need to inflate the balloon I've put an asterisk here for the simple reason that I made this mistake other people have made this mistake as well and now the whole department is aware not to make this mistake though we turn over so I'm sure it'll happen again Three-way catheters, they don't have 10 ml size balloons. They have 30 ml size balloon. And most people, and when we're talking about catheterization, most people are like, oh, it's 10 ml. I put 10 ml and everyone's like 10 ml. What will happen is this, this balloon will not inflate properly. There's usually a lot of stuff hanging to this catheter. And at some point, it will just slip out. And it slipped out. For my catheter slipped out. Other people's catheters slipped out. So make sure if... The the little plasticky bit at the beginning, so the green bit here, the blue bit here, the red bit here, there's usually an orange bit here, it has it written how much fluid the balloon needs to be inflated. So make sure you read that. Um, and again, it might change. Some, maybe you'll have a two-way which doesn't need 10, it needs 15 or 20. So it's always good to just read and see what, what, what it needs. So that's why I put a little asterisk there because it's not always 10. And then with any procedure that has stuff coming in and out of the body, I always make sure that I have a collection bowl with me because you don't know what will happen. 
and it's always good to have that on hand that suddenly you've you've just put in a little bit and suddenly loads of urine starts coming out you don't have your catheter connected to the bag yet so you at least have a little pot that you can just quickly just grab it and just put it in there and you know everything will just collect there and then that's fine you know rather than it splashing everywhere so we'll just watch another video because again i think that's the most useful way of just seeing how this is procedure is done My name's Adam, I'm a fan, you're a medical student. Can I check your name? It's Lewis Potter. Great. And what's your date of birth, Lewis? It's the 5th of the 9th, 1988. Okay. I need to insert a catheter to monitor your urine output. This will involve me inserting a small flexible tube into your penis to reach the bladder. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be too painful. I'll insert some local anaesthetic into the penis to make the procedure as comfortable as possible. Have you ever been allergic to local anaesthetic? No, no. Okay. There'll be a member of the nursing staff present throughout to act as a chaperone. Does all of that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds fine. Great. I'll just go and get my equipment ready. I'm going to insert some local anaesthetic now. It might sting a little bit, but it should go numb quite quickly. Now I'm going to insert the caster. Let me know if you feel any pain. Okay, that's the end of the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you. To complete the procedure, I would fill out all relevant documentation, making sure to note urine colour, residual urine volume and any complications.
So again, when it's when it's like it's easy, it, it is as simple as that. Unfortunately, a lot of the times the patients that come in that need one done in an emergency that it will be a junior putting it in, it will probably be someone with an enlarged prostate, they're experiencing hematuria, it's or you know, someone has tried multiple times and it's failed and then now you have to give it a go. So it's not always as simple as that, but the steps are are exactly the same. Um, the, the only difference, I think, I think their catheter pack has multiple sterile gloves, so I understand that they've done it in a sterile fashion. A lot of the things that we do um, will just be with aseptic gloves until you put the catheter in. That is the last step that usually we do with just sterile gloves. And then the other thing is that we've kind of learned in a way that once you've held on with your left hand, now you can only use your right hand. So we just managed to put everything with just our right hands. Every place has a different way of doing things. But again, as long as it's aseptic and you manage to put everything in, it's not painful, um, it should be fine. It should not be, you knew, You need a little bit of manipulation and a little bit of just kind of sliding it through to put in the catheter. But if you cannot put it through without putting a lot of force, don't do it. It might be that, you know, the, the, the prostate is completely, you know, completely way too large, it's causing a complete obstruction and a urologist should probably put in a catheter, not you. So if you try and you can't manage to like wiggle the tube through, just stop and get a senior to come and help you. Uh, or come in and see the situation. So positioning is, again, with all procedures is key, but especially with this one, a lot of the times what you might not notice because there's so much going on, there's so many, there's so much equipment, there's so much stuff that you, your, your positioning is a little bit low. So you might actually want to like straighten it out a little bit. And once you straighten it out, you'll see that it passes through a lot smoother. Um, and then obviously this is supposed to be done in aseptic conditions, you'll see a lot of people do it in, in ways that are a little bit questionable because they'll touch things that are not clean and then they'll touch their tray and stuff which isn't clean. So just be very mindful of what is clean and what is not clean and just not to make the, make sure that those things don't touch. And if something from the clean side touches non-clean stuff, it's non-clean now. You can't put it back on the table. You have to put it into one of the bags or something like that. Knowing how much volume you need to inflate the balloon is something that we discussed, and that is definitely very important. It'll slip out and basically you have to come and put another one in. So just make sure that the balloon is inflated and you've pulled back to make sure that, oh yeah, it's not, it's not sliding out. I've had to do some very traumatic ones where there was a patient who unfortunately they tried six times before they referred him to the hospital and he had like traumatic bleeding now. There's a lot of hematuria. It was, it was very bloody and all of that stuff. And, the, you know, and once I put the catheter through, there was a lot of your blood and urine coming out. So I was very fortunate that the nurse next to me was very experienced. She had some towels ready. Uh, and then she also brought me extra gloves as well because, you know, a lot of things get messy. So just, you know, you can kind of, you'll get a sense of this once you do a few of like, okay, what do I need? Should I bring extra stuff? You know, all of these things. So just be prepared. It's, it's always the worst is that when you have one hand, you know, you know, and like now you can't move and, you know, you need more stuff and it's not with you and you don't have anyone to call. It's just awkward, right? So just try to get all the stuff you need, even if you bring extra stuff, because you can always take it back. Because even you haven't opened it and put it into the sterile field, it's still in its wrapper. You can still put it back. So I always bring extra stuff when I feel like I'm. this might be a little bit tricky. So then we'll just quickly move on to the last one, which is an NG tube. Again, a purely surgical thing. You won't have to do this on any other department. But it's a simple thing, and, and juniors can definitely do it. Um, I have found, uh, thankfully, a little bit of success using a bit of tricks here and there with NG tubes. Um, the, the things that you need is instill gel. So, you know, a lot of people were like, when I initially started using insta gel, people were like, what are you using insta gel for? Are you going to put that in someone's in mouth or nose? And I'm like, yes. It, if you read the packet for it, it's it's safe for mucosal surfaces, including your upper airway and your, like your nose and your mouth. Um, what I what I do, which some people also do as well, is that they just take a little bit of insta gel and they kind of just put it into the into the nose that you're trying to go into, and also just wrap, wrap like putting the insta gel into the tray and just putting the NG tube through it. It just you know it's you know it, it numbs the area a little bit and it just makes things easier to slide through. So I found that very helpful. A lot of people don't do that. Uh, you need lots and lots and lots and lots of tape. Unfortunately, I have had two NG tubes just drop out because I just hadn't put enough tape on it. You want to put so much tape that when you pull at the end, 
no matter how much force is there, it's not going out. So, you know, just one on the bridge, one like a couple of side ones, you wrap a little bit on the tube as well. You just want to make sure it's secure. So you just wrap it up and you just make sure that it's completely secure. Having a six bolt is absolutely necessary. I will share a story of what happened with my worst NG tube ever, but having a sick bowl, multiple sick bowls is very, very important. A glass of water is is very, very, very important. It. I don't think you can do this procedure without having a glass of water or maybe with a straw. If the patient isn't swallowing little sips, I think it's almost impossible to pass that through. You'll need an enteral bag. And the, this is different with the other ones because you can see there's like little purple ends at the end here. And that's just because NG tubes have a special connection. So you can't just connect it to a, any bag. It has to be a specific enteral bag. If not, there are other ways that you can kind of like pull this segment off a little bit and you can kind of squeeze it through um, what we call a bile bag sometimes, but that's not the ideal thing. Try to find the proper bag that connects to what you're, you're inserting. And then ideally you'd want to have a pH testing strip and a, and a huge syringe with the, with the end that connects to your tube so that you can kind of aspirate a little bit of the aspirate and just test it. It should be acidic. That's how you know that you're in the stomach. Um, we don't do it because most of the time it's either a very obvious that you're in because there suddenly there's a lot of gunk that's coming up or B you'll, you'll get an x-ray. So this is, is kind of a waste. We don't do it much anymore. Um, but you know, it's still something that you should, you should consider. So we'll just watch the quick video on how an NG tube is done. Adam, I'm a medical student. Can I take your name? Hi there, it's Lewis Potter. And what's your date of birth, Lewis? It's the 5th of the 9th, 1988. Okay. At the moment, you're unable to swallow food safely. Because of this, I'm going to insert a fine tube through your nose and into your stomach. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be too painful. If it does get too uncomfortable, let me know and we can stop. Are you okay for me to go ahead with the procedure? Yes, that sounds fine. I'm going to put the tube in now. It's going to be a bit uncomfortable. If you could take small sips of water while I'm advancing the tube and tap me on the arm if it gets too uncomfortable. I've now finished the procedure. The tube will get a bit more comfortable over the next few hours. To complete the procedure, I would order a chest x-ray to confirm the position of the tube if I was unable to aspirate gastric contents. So yeah, um, 
I will admit that it's not it's never that easy that you just slide it through all the way and you just say, oh yeah, that's that's fine. The coiling thing is very real. I have seen that happen with a lady, unfortunately, that we were advancing, advancing, and then she suddenly opens her mouth and the, the, the tube just flies out at us. So you do have to make sure that it is actually going down. Same thing with their with the with making sure that it's going into the esophagus. If they keep if they will cough invariably when they're doing this procedure but if they start coughing a lot constantly and you know like and you're feeling resistance while putting it down just pull it back up it you might be going into an, the airway by accident so you know just those are things to feel but you 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 the more you do it again the more uh, the more uh, you know confident you'll be and the more you'll recognize these things when you do them um, as I said earlier, you want to make sure all the pieces fit. So it's really embarrassing sometimes when you get the wrong syringe and now you can't connect the syringe to the NG tube and then you're like, oh my God, I can't aspirate anything. Um, with the aspirate, the pH thing, again, because in our department, the rule is just, oh, if you're unsure, just do an x-ray. Like, you know, we don't, we don't want to be like, oh, I think I got some aspirate. You know, no, no we just, we just do that. But uh, yes, in an ideal world, you'd want to, you know, check the pH of it as well. Um, and still a gel is safe for mucous membranes and I really feel like I, again, I just inject a little bit into the nose that I'm going in and I just let it sit for a second and then I just wipe out whatever excess is there and then if I find that it's a lot easier for patients to do it. So maybe just give, give that a go. Sips of water really does the trick. I just make them just, you know, with a straw, they're just sitting there and I'm like, okay, could you just take a sip? And while they're sipping, that's when I advance. And it kind of, it's almost like a trick as if like, oh, they're just drinking water and it just, you know, it just goes in. Um, and then I, I really have to stress this because this has happened to me twice that I, you know, they're, they've come in because they're vomiting and they're suspected small bowel obstruction. So obviously they're MPO now and you need to put an NG tube and the junior is going to do it. So I'm the junior who's going to put it in. And then the, the second you get into the stomach, two things will happen. One is that suddenly now all of the, the contents that were sitting there and not passing anywhere will now start coming out of the tube. And then I unfortunately, and then at the same time, the patient will start throwing up as well. So now you have bile that's basically coming out of this tube that you need to now put somewhere. And then they're also vomiting. So always just have a sick bowl ready. And the second you put you, the second you feel like it's going through, you just, you just move the, the, you know, your one end that's secure. You don't want it to slip out. And the other end, you just grab it and you just put it into the sick bowl. And then you, they will start throwing up into the sick bowl as well. And that's fine. You just have to stand there. Um, and then having tissues nearby is helpful as well, because otherwise you're it's awkward because now you have to hold this. It's not secure yet. But then you also want to give him tissues. And there's no tissues nearby because he's just thrown up. So just having everything beforehand and just knowing that this is something that can go wrong and being prepared for it really, really helps. Um, and then again, knowing that where the end of your tube is at all time is very important because you'll just slide it in and you'll be like, oh, that's fine. And it's pointing like straight down at like your pants or something. And then suddenly all the bile just starts, you know, going onto your pants. Um, I haven't had anything that bad, but it has happened to a few people. So just be aware that this is something that can happen. And again, just taking your time. I think the hardest part really is just going through the nasopharynx. I think once you pass the the epiglottis, it just kind of just it goes by itself. But just that beginning bit is a little bit difficult. You don't need to use too much pressure or force. And I think the biggest tip and I think the biggest mistake that people do is they think that it needs to go up the nose. It doesn't because you're not going towards the brain. You're going straight and down. So you actually want to once you're in, you just want to press like towards the back of their head and then you'll just kind of it just breaks away and then it goes through. So again, it's positioning and it seems that, oh, that's so obvious. I would never, you know, try to put it up the nose. You'll be surprised how many people go in the heat of the moment. They just start trying to shove it up. They're like, oh, why isn't it going? Because you're not trying to make it go up. You're trying to make it go back and, and down. So just try to just to aim straight. So again, at any point in any procedure, if you feel like you're getting stuck and you don't know what to do, just take a time out and just think, okay, do, am I following all the right steps? Is there something else that I'm supposed to be doing right now? Is there a reason why this isn't working? Should I try again? Maybe should I restart? Just, you know, always in any procedure, just just have be ready to have that time out and just think, OK, how can I do this differently? Is maybe positioning the patient differently, maybe, you know, maybe using more lubricant, maybe, you know, 
just all of these things, you should just always be ready to just reassess what's going on with any patient. It doesn't have to be a procedure as well if you know you're doing something and it's not working. Just just have a time out and think of what you can do differently. So hopefully that was beneficial. Uh, I hope that you know you learned something uh, there. Is there anything that I can? Is there any questions that anybody has? Anything related to the, either the procedures or anything in general that I can answer? Please feel free to ask. Um, if you would be so kind, I would really, really appreciate if you just do the feedback. Yes, Taymor, go ahead. Yes, so I have a question regarding the nasogastric uh, tube length. So mm -hmm. what were the two lengths they measured? So what they measure is they measure from the tragus of the ear. So they'll, they'll hold the tube from the tragus of the ear till the nose which is basically the, the estimated length of the nasopharynx that it needs, the tube needs to cross. And then from the nose down to your ziffy sternum. And that's just like a rough estimate of how far it needs to go in to reach the stomach. Most of the time, it's the length is usually 50 centimeters, 50 to 60 centimeters. But the reason why we do this, it really isn't that big of an issue with people who are like smaller, like little old ladies, you know, even at 45, you might be fine. The problem is with patients who are a little bit more obese and bigger, you actually need to put a lot of length in and you don't realize that. And you'll go to 50 and you think that you're in and you're not. And then you do an x-ray and you find out, oh, I'm actually completely like I still haven't even entered the stomach yet. So that's the only reason kind of why we measure. It. So it's it's from the ear to the nose and then down to the ziffy sternum. And again, it's around 50 ish centimeters. All right, thank you. No worries. Uh, yeah, that's it. That was okay. my question. Well, thank, no worries. Happy to help. So yeah, if you're if you're watching this now or if you're watching this in a recording, if you could just fill out the feedback form, it would really mean a lot to me. And uh, I hope that this has benefited in any way. If at any moment, at any time, if there's anything I can help with, please feel free to email me. Um, I haven't included my email here, but I'm, I'm pretty easy to reach. If you just search my name, Shahir Khan, on the system, you'll find one of my emails and you can just email me any of your queries. I hope that this series has been beneficial. This is my last lecture of the series. Um, my colleague, Dr. Abigail, will be giving two talks, one on the 27th of December and one on the 28th. The 27th of December is the second part of her talk of on, the, on the NCA examination, which is an examination you need to give if you're going to medical, uh, if you're going to the, to the UK uh, a few years after graduating. And then I think a lecture series, a lecture which will be very beneficial for everybody is her lecture on the SJT. So it, that'll be on the 28th of December, uh, 2022. So please uh, do join. I, and I hope that this lecture series has been beneficial. Um, all the best to all of you. I know that you guys will do great. Again, you've been taught at RCSI. And even in the toughest of moments, believe me, you have the training, you have the core skills to advance and do, do what it is to take care of the, your patients. So that'll be me. That'll be it for me. Uh, all the best, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Doc.